Thanks. Um, for those of you who don't me, my name is Shankar Viswanathan. I work at AMD, that's my day job. Um, so I, I work on the chip design side, uh, but um, uh, at home, uh, I like to tinker with software and, and other things. And um, one of my goals is to not rely upon the cloud for, for most things. And so um, that's what kind of, um, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been running um, various things on, on um, you know, desktops and, and old laptops at home, Raspberry Pi, that type of stuff. Uh, but it was getting very difficult to manage. And um, basically uh, at some point, I think this was about six or seven months ago, uh, I, um, where's my mouse? Okay. Yeah. So I, I decided I, I needed a new server to put, put all of these things, uh, together and to tie a bunch of, uh, different things that I had distributed over a few other machines. So I just wanted to consolidate everything into, into one system. Uh, basically, uh, my needs are fairly simple uh, for home. Uh, want to run the NAS, store all my data. I run Nextcloud, and I've been running that for a few years now. Um, for those of you who don't know, Nextcloud kind of descended from own cloud. Uh, and um, uh, it allows like sort of like a Dropbox style functionality. Uh, allows you to um, synchron synchronize files between different systems. Um, the good thing about Next, so Sync thing kind of does the same thing, but the nice thing about Next Cloud is that they also have uh, client apps for for Android, and uh, and basically it allows you to. So what I have set up is, uh, you know, when I when I uh, I'm at home and, and I'm charging my phone, all the pictures from my phone automatically get synced to Nextcloud, uh, which, uh, uh, which it's, there are a couple of times where the, the app creates issues, especially as your collection grows. Uh, but for the most part, it's been working. So I just, and, and I had this running on an, on an old laptop with a with a USB drive connected to uh, basically a USB um, uh, a SATA to USB uh, adapter, uh, and um, uh, you know that was also creating trouble. So I thought, okay, let's move that over as well. And then I run a few other VMs. So I run a Home Assistant instance um, for some simple things at home. Uh, I have Unify um, access points at home and the Unify controller runs in a VM. And then I wanted some random VMs just to do testing and, and um, uh, try out software or something. And if it doesn't work, I can just toss the VM. So, so this is basically what my requirements were for, for, this, uh, for this system. Uh, and by the way, stop me anytime if any of you have questions. Uh, don't want this to be a long monologue. <clears throat> um, so this this is kind of what I wanted out of the system, uh, and then I started looking at okay, how can I, um, what do I need to get this thing uh, going, and kind of these were the the choices for for the hypervisor, uh, uh, Proxmox uh, virtual environment, VMware, um, Zen. Or you know, I could throw something together uh, using Debian, KVM, and and Vert Manager. I thought about that. I mean, I kind of ruled out VMware uh, just because it's not open. Uh, Zen, I don't know how popular it is these days and how much active development is going on. Uh, Proxmox seemed to have a lot of community effort behind it, as well as a company backing it. And like I said earlier, like in my in my younger days, I would have I might have been tempted to go the DIY route, but 
uh, I just don't have the time for it. So I just wanted something that works. So essentially the, the choice boiled down to Proxmox. Uh, so uh, uh, Proxmox, uh, the, the virtual environment, uh, there are, the Proxmox has other products, but the, the one I'm talking about is, is Proxmox VE or virtual environment. Um, it's, uh, it's essentially um, the DIY solution that I was talking out about, but with, with uh, some level of polish that others have already done. So uh, it's it's based on a on a on Debian and with a custom um, Linux kernel, and then there's a a web interface for for management. I mean, you can still um, uh, log in, get a shell, and and do everything from the command line. Uh, but most things you can also just uh, do with a few clicks on the on the web interface. Uh, like I said, it's it's maintained by a company based in based in Austria. Uh, all their code uh, is under uh, the AGPL v3 license. Um, uh, and as we were just talking, they they have enterprise support um, available with a with a subscription. So uh, and that also gives uh, uh, the subscriber access to some extra repositories. With you can go stick with a stable version or um, you can choose to, I think they have some other features that are only available for, for enterprise customers. Uh, but I didn't really go into, look into what those were because like I said, my needs are very modest. I didn't require all of that. Uh, and from what I can tell, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of active development and, and, uh, and tons of community support. Um, which were important because if I if I get stuck on something and have to Google um, these days, most of the times I find the answer in some um, Stack Exchange thread or or Reddit thread. Uh, so uh, you know that kind of support. Since I'm not paying for the subscription, having that community uh, support is kind of nice. Uh, so uh, if you if you uh, uh, look at what Proxbox says, this is directly from their website. Um, it, it uses KVM for full virtualization. So essentially it's a type one hypervisor uh, with um, all the, uh, you know, the uh, drivers for, for networking and all these, uh, and all the other host um, devices already built in. Uh, I mean, they're just standard Linux kernel drivers. Uh, and the nice thing is on top of hosting uh, VMs, you could also uh, run Alexi based uh, containers uh, right right on top of the base system. Um, I didn't do that, but that's uh, if you want to run other apps uh, within within these Alexi containers, you can do that. Uh, and then they have uh, these, uh, uh, daemons running at the bottom, and then a bunch of user tools to manage everything. So uh, it, it's it's like I said, it's it's uh, it's that DIY Debian thing that I was talking about, with but with a bunch of helpful tools and and a polished interface. Um, so uh, in terms of the major features, at least the ones that uh, uh, were interesting to me. Uh, uh, it has both a, a web base as well as a um, CLI interface to, to control uh, and set up and configure all that jazz. Um, it allows clustering of nodes uh, and you can migrate uh, VMs from, from one node to another live. Uh, it offers uh, a fairly significant network configuration options. Uh, you could do the standard bridge network. You could set up uh, uh, each each VM to be on a, on different VLANs, um, and has some other advanced routing that I didn't need, but but is available for uh, for other use cases. And then the the baseline storage it can also be configured as a storage server itself. Uh, you could, it, it supports standard Linux LVM. 
and then you could do um, Samba, Ceph, all these other kind of things right, right on the base hypervisor. Uh, <clears throat> so this is what the uh, the kind of the web GUI looks like. Uh, um, I can run through. I'll show you my instance uh, later on, but basically um, on the left panel here. So this this is just a screenshot from from their website. Um, you can see all the different. Um, so in their terminology, the data center is the whole um, cluster, and then you can have multiple nodes uh, here. So these nodes here are, are uh, labeled PV demo one through five. And then within each node, you can have uh, multiple uh, VMs or containers, right? So here um, you can see, you know, different Linux distributions running um, on, on, on different VMs. There's a, there's a Windows VM, you know, and so forth, right? So on, on, on each of these nodes, you can choose to um, run different. And I think here, these are all um, services that are running. Uh, and the, the uh, like I said, they support live migration. So if you want to say, I'm going to shut down um, this node and I want to move all these VMs to a different host, um, you can literally stop them here and 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 move them over. It's it's uh, I I tried it just uh, um, uh, uh, initially. I mean, again, I don't have any use for it, but but um, if you want to do that, it's very easy to set up. I I could do it with with minimal googling. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this is my instance, but I'll I'll come to that later. I'll, I'll just run through the the setup. Uh, so, so that was the the kind of the the proxmox part, um, and then uh, for the for the NAS, um, uh, I looked at a few different uh, options. Uh, so, true NAS um, itself, there are two versions, scale or core, and we'll go into the differences in a in a little bit. Uh, then there's like Open Media Vault, um, Unraid. Um, there's a couple other uh, ones too, but these seem to be kind of the more popular ones. Um, and uh, and from all accounts, like TrueNAS seems to be the uh, the most suggested one, especially for uh, somebody who knows their way around uh, uh, Unix command line. Uh, I think there was some. There was one other one which was like a um, a very simple to set up, but it also had limited options. And uh, uh, and the other thing was TrueNAS supports um, ZFS um, out of the box, while some of the other ones didn't. Uh, and Unraid is not free. Um, again, I'm not opposed to paying for software, but uh, in, in this case, it, it just seemed like TrueNAS would do what I wanted it to do. So I that's what I chose. Uh, so TrueNAS um, itself is it's maintained by a company called IX Systems, and I have a link here. But there's kind of very interesting history behind this company. So it traces its roots back to the original Berkeley Software Distribution Inc. And um, you know those of us who have uh, a few gray hairs will remember uh, Walnut Creek um, CD-ROM. So, so this company at one point owned uh, uh, Walnut Creek, and uh, you know I certainly uh, purchased CDs from them for I think it was like some Slackware distribution back in the mid '90s when um, when uh, you know uh, it wasn't possible to download the whole distro over a 14.4 or 28.8 kilobits modem. Uh, and I don't know, I think it, you, uh, otherwise your other option was a stack of like 30 floppies. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah, it's kind of interesting that um, that uh, IX Systems tr traces its lineage to kind of those type of companies um, back, in, back in the 90s. Uh, and then it kind of morphed um, uh, uh, around and, and now essentially they have uh, 
um, they, their primary product is uh, TrueNAS. So, so the TrueNAS core, it was originally called FreeNAS and, and essentially IX Systems took over uh, the project, FreeNAS project from its original founders. Uh, and uh, uh, they renamed it to TrueNAS at some point. Uh, and it, it's a, so that one is based on a free BSD kernel and, and user land. Uh, and today they call that product TrueNAS Core. Uh, uh, three or four years ago, they announced uh, a new product called TrueNAS Scale, which essentially has the same kind of uh, uh, interface, but um, instead of being based on FreeBSD, it essentially has a Debian base. Um, this was announced in um, 2020. Uh, and it was in alpha and beta till about 2022. And I think late 2022, early 23 is when it basically uh, uh, was generally available, um, not, not in beta. And uh, uh, both of these products basically use ZFS as their, as their file system, open ZFS to be precise. Uh, so, um, uh, so like I said, there are there are there are two variants, core and scale, and then they also have a sort of enterprise edition, similar to Proxmox, uh, where uh, you you get a bunch of other goodies with your with your subscription, and and you know support is the is the main thing, but there's some other enterprisey features that uh, you get with the subscription. Um, so here's a quick comparison. Again, this is, uh, um, you can go to that URL at the, at the top here uh, and, and go read for yourself. But the kind of, I just took a screenshot of some of the, the highlights uh, over there. Uh, you can see most of the things, uh, the difference between core and scale comes down to the free BSD versus Linux. So uh, the, um, uh, TrueNAS also supports virtualization, so you can run VMs on top of TrueNAS. So TrueNAS Core, because it's based on FreeBSD, uses the Beehive um, uh, uh, virtualization, uh, whereas uh, Scale, again, because it's Linux, it basically uses KVM. Um, and uh, Scale also allows running uh, apps on top uh, using uh, Kubernetes. Uh, uh, I, so the, uh, TrueNAS Core has some other way of doing that uh, through using, um, from what I can tell, it's some variant of FreeBSD jails. Uh, but the the sort of the list of apps that you can install uh, through that mechanism is is pretty limited at least at this point. Uh, and the other nice thing was scale um, allows, uh, um, I forget, there was one other point here that that was interesting. Uh, maybe it'll come to me later, but, but uh, um, uh, it, because it's Linux, I think, I think you get a lot of benefits of that, whereas, Whereas on on uh, uh, on core, uh, you're you're somewhat li limited by what FreeBSD can can support. Um, Hardware-wise, you know, obviously because this is based on Debian, uh, pretty much any machine that can run Debian will be able to run Scale easily, uh, while core is a little more picky. So this is if you choose to run. Um, uh, TrueNAS as your uh, operating system, bare metal. Um, I chose to run it on, inside a VM on top of Proxmox and, and I'll, I'll show you some reasons why. Uh, but if if you want to run it on bare metal, um, you should keep in mind that TrueNAS core has um, some driver issues. Uh, so you have to be careful when, when choosing your hardware. Me talking for a while. Anybody has any questions? All right, I'll take that as a no. 
uh, and you know, so most of the other things are kind of the same that, you know, in terms of the, the, the file protocol support, um, it's, it's very similar uh, between the two. So you can do um, SMB, CIFS or, or NFS, and then, you know, FTP, rsync, all of that. Um, Bluster FS is there, but I, of late, I think there's been, yes. I I don't know if this is 100% true, but I, I might've heard that core might be getting deprecated or at least some major features are being deprecated in core and that the uh, IX system is encouraging people to migrate to scale. Do you know anything about that? I have read similar things, uh, but if you go on their website, they make no such statement. Um, uh, and it sounds like, but I think there is a lot of speculation that internally within the company, more effort is being spent on scale than on core. So they might still maintain it, but I don't know if, if at one point <clears throat> core will become enterprise only or something. It's, it's, uh, it, I mean, I'm speculating, but, but, um, Nothing is clear from their website. They 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 claim both are both are being developed and both are supported. But there there are all these rumors, like whatever whatever you read, uh, I have read as well. Uh, uh, I I I don't know how much truth there is to it because certainly I couldn't find any source from the company that says one way or the other. Uh, okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so, uh, you know, TrueNAS scale is based on ZFS. I don't want to go into details of ZFS. I remember, I think it was a year and a half, maybe two years ago, we had a, we had a talk here at Blue uh, BLU on, on ZFS, which talked through the, the file system itself in, in, in great detail, and there's a lot of material available on on ZFS online, obviously. Uh, but I'll just hit a couple of uh, of uh, major uh, points uh, on on um, ZFS, uh, particularly as it applies to TrueNAS scale. And TrueNAS scale is what I ended up installing. Uh, so uh, you know, it's it's uh, Open ZFS and uh, it allows uh, a single disk uh, in terms of storage. Uh, you could go have a single disk or you can stripe your data across uh, multiple disks. Uh, you don't get any redundancy, but um, data spread over multiple disks. And so you get a better read and write performance. Uh, and then you can do a, a plain mirror. Uh, so you get, you get redundancy and um, and faster read performance, uh, uh, and or you have these different RAID options. So uh, ZFS calls them RAID Z1, Z2, Z3. Um, in more general terminology, you, you might think of them as RAID 5 or RAID 6, RAID 10, um, something like that. Um, essentially, what uh, uh, RAID Z1 does is uh, you need at least three drives, three physical disks, and uh, your data is uh, stored in. Uh, uh, basically, you have you have uh, uh, one um, uh, checksum or or, or uh, mirror. Like, pff, sorry, let me repeat that. So you you use you have your checksum in in one and data in the other. So you never have both the data and the, and the checksum in the same, uh, or the, what they call the uh, data in, in the same uh, disk. So if you lose one disk, then you can still recover all your data. Uh, it, uh, Z2 uh, puts the, I think they call it parity, uh, that goes into two disks. So you could lose two disks and still be able to recover your, your data and and so forth. Z three is you know th third level, um, so it's just so if you have three disks or four disks and you choose RAID Z one, um, then your data is distributed across these disks and the 
parity is never held in the same disk as your data. Uh, uh, and yeah, the, the more, the higher the rate level you want to go, you're trading off uh, reliability for capacity. Uh, so uh, you lose, so uh, if you have three disks uh, for uh, rate Z1, and again, all these disks have to be of the same size, which is one of the limitations. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, if you have uh, uh, three two terabyte drives, then your effective capacity in Z1 mode is only four terabytes. Uh, you lose you lose one third of that capacity for uh, for the uh, parity stuff, or you could do four disks, and, and now you lose twenty five percent. So, but in 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 that case, you know, you can survive loss of one disk. Uh, and then ZFS supports uh, snapshots and it's incremental. So essentially uses a copy and write mechanism and, and you can do uh, as many snapshots as you want. Uh, and uh, TrueNAS scale also allows you to do full ZFS replication or you can R sync it to another disk or you can use something like sync thing to, to uh, synchronize disks. And, and replicate them. Uh, uh, so uh, it we it also supports inline compression and and deduplication. Uh, this obviously reduces the amount of overall storage, uh, uh, so the space that you occupy on the disk. But obviously there are overheads um, when you enable these these features. Uh, uh, ZFS has an excellent caching mechanism, uh, and it the first level is it caches uh, frequently used files in in DRAM. Therefore, the more memory you can throw at ZFS, the the better the performance. Uh, most frequently used stuff is simply going to be in RAM. Uh, and then, if you're using uh, spinning disks, uh, you could also set up uh, um, an SSD, NVMe or SATA SSD, uh, as a as a uh, a cache. So that way, um, you can you can you get higher uh, performance, uh, and uh, you still get the benefit of the larger storage size of of your hard disks relative to the NVMe's that are available today at a reasonable price, anyway. Uh, and <clears throat> um, so in terms of data protection, um, you know, ZFS uh, uh, is constantly checking uh, and the, the checksum allows detection and, and repair of any um, bit flips that, that happened. Um, and then you can also enable uh, encryption uh, uh, at, at the disk level, pool level, or data set level. Uh, and uh, again, this comes with performance overhead. Uh, but if you really need it, you can enable it. Uh, so this is the sort of, a, again, another screenshot. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick demo when I uh, show you my dashboard. But this is, what, um, this is what the web interface looks like. And on the right here is, is your um, CLI if you if you uh, go to the console uh, and you know I guess the most common thing is to just hit number seven and, and you drop into a, a root shell and then you can do um, whatever configuration you want that way but if you quickly want to configure network or something you can do it through these other other options and yeah you know you can see on the left there's a bunch of things here and I'll I'll um, touch upon a few things when I when I show you my my system. Uh, so as I said, I decided to run to NAS scale uh, in a VM and, and not as uh, the host in the bare, in the bare metal. Um, so even though TrueNAS scale allows you to set up VMs on on top of it, uh, the VM interface I, I when I tried it was Kind of clunky um, and not definitely not as streamlined as Proxmox. 
the other thing is that uh, uh, it the, the Truna scale will use up all of the boot disk. So even if you, let's say, have a terabyte disk, and the actual operating system only needs maybe 100 gigabytes or something, uh, but you can't use the remaining space for anything. You can't even use it to to um, uh, put your VM images uh, in that. Um, so uh, you know, in in some ways, maybe for backup and other things, it's better to put those in a different disk. Uh, but you know, if you're limited by the number of ports you have and how many disks you can have in your system, um, this could be an an issue. Uh, and uh, and then in in my case, I have a a, a couple of different uh, VLANs on my on my network. And I didn't want the Proxmox management, sorry, the, the uh, uh, TrueNAS scale management to be on the same VLAN as the actual service. Uh, and I couldn't find an easy way to separate that. Uh, uh, so uh, um, in my case, you know, the, my Proxmox um, uh, runs on, on my um, management LAN, a VLAN, and then my NAS runs on a on a different VLAN, uh, and I can I can have all my other devices uh, be able to access uh, true NAS and 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 Nextcloud on on this other VLAN, and on that VLAN nobody can go touch Proxmox itself, which I thought would be a useful feature from at least from a basic security standpoint at home. Uh, so, um, so that's kind of the high level things, at least the things that I looked at in terms of Proxmox and, and Truna scale. Um, and like I said, I'll, I'll walk you through, um, my installation in a, in a little bit. Uh, but then the next question was, okay, I've decided what I need, uh, in terms of software, um, what, what hardware do I, uh, need to run? all of this and um you know um looking at looking at the requirements so if i if i run if i want to run proxmox as my hypervisor i essentially need an x86 chip of some sort uh that supports virtualization and just based on what i want to do i thought maybe four to eight cores would be enough preferably higher uh, as in the higher end of that closer to eight cores uh, and um, I would require um, Intel VTD or AMD IMMU support for, for PCIe pass-through. And I'll talk about that in a, in a second. Uh, and then overall, I need, like I said, you know, um, TrueNAS and ZFS um, uh, really benefit from a ton of RAM. So I needed something fairly beefy. Uh, so 48 gigabytes I thought would be would be good uh, and had to be ECC RAM. Uh, and then two or three open PCIe slots because I wanted to add NVMe storage. Uh, and so I, that needed at least one by 16 slot other than the one that I would need for a GPU if I chose a chip that did not have an integrated GPU. And and I would also preferably support, uh, I need, need a motherboard and BIOS that supported PCIe bifurcation. And I have another slide here on, on what that is and why that's important. And needed uh, M.2 and VME and SATA ports for my, for my disks. Uh, and I wanted to go uh, with a used hardware. Uh, it's cheaper um, and, you know, saves it from going in the landfill for, for a few more years. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, that's, what I, that, that's what I thought I would need. And so kind of um, looked on eBay and Craigslist and all the usual places to, uh, to find a machine. And ultimately I ended up with, with um, this machine. Um, it's a, um, Lenovo ThinkStation P520. So this machine is from, uh, I think 2018, 2019 uh, kind of timeframe. 
so a little bit old but not not too old uh and the seller had listed this as you know um uh from a from a corporate lease uh it came off the lease uh <clears throat> uh the as you can see um uh, on you know it has a bunch of different pcie slots uh uh and and it has nvme slots so you can't see here but this this heat sink over here has an nvmes um at the bottom and you know it has a decent storage option and like disk uh bay in if i wanted to put a bunch of moving disks uh yeah this is the two uh, it has two drive uh, cages here there's so it supports two disks here and there's one other cage where i could stick two more drives if i wanted uh uh the the cpu is a, a xeon uh w2135 and you may ask since i work for amd why why did i go with a uh with a xeon processor uh and my and my answer was that uh all the all the other amd options were way more expensive so i got this whole machine for um for about a little over 200 bucks and the the um uh the 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 cheapest uh amd one that i could find was well over 700 bucks and and my joke is that uh the the those amd thread rippers and and epics work so well that nobody wants to sell them uh or not, not sell them for cheap anyway uh so anyway so this is the this is the machine I, I i ended up buying um it has this xeon it's a six core 12 thread uh processor and this machine came with uh four 16 gigabyte uh dims um ecc r dims for a total of 64 gigabytes of uh, of of memory uh and then uh, I bought a bunch of storage. Um, so essentially, I have three two terabyte uh, disks for uh, my ZFS pool, and then a one terabyte uh, boot uh, SSD, and uh, a six terabyte uh, disk that uh, uh, wanted to back up some of these things, as well as I have another older four terabyte disk that I also wanted to stick in. So um, all of these things came from uh, from uh, the, the candy store on Memorial Drive, as I call it, uh, Micro Center. <clears throat> uh, and you know, there was a sale on, on these uh, uh, drives at that time, and I got it for a reasonable, uh, reasonable price. Uh, so this is all the other parts. You know, I had a, uh, uh, a GPU lying around. Uh, since this is a workstation process, it didn't have built-in graphics. So I did need a, a, a separate uh, discrete GPU card. Um, those are the four NVMEs I showed in the previous picture, the hard disk. And, and this one uh, here is um, uh, uh, basically, this is a PCIe card that supports four um, NVMe slots, so I could plug these drives in inside this and 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 connect it over PCIe. Uh, so uh, because I did so, here's the here's the picture, right? Uh, um, uh, the 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 my boot disk I I connected uh, directly on the motherboard's uh, NVMe slot. Um, and then these three, the two, so that's a one terabyte um, um, NVMe. Uh, that was my boot drive, and I'm also using it to store my VM images. Uh, and these three um, uh, two terabyte disks uh, are uh, are my um, storage. Uh, um, there's a fourth fourth slot available here. You can see, so. Um, ZFS recently added the feature where I can expand my 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 pool. So uh, I, these three are in RAID Z1, so I can add a fourth disk and and in that same pool. So uh, if I want to expand my storage, I could buy a fourth uh, disk and 
basically have the whole thing get rebalanced uh, with that fourth drive. Uh, this feature wasn't available on ZFS until very recently. Um, that patch got uh, got merged in to the ZFS uh, mainline. Uh, so yeah, so uh, this this uh, adapter basically is nothing but a big um, aluminum heatsink that goes on top of these um, NVMEs, and there's a fan you can see at the bottom uh, for some active cooling. Uh, so um, so yeah, so so I put all of the, uh, the three data drives into this uh, into this card. Uh, and um, what what we need is, is this feature called PCIe bifurcation because now I have, um, in my case, uh, three or up to four independent uh, M.2 drives. Each of them is essentially a by four PCIe link. Um, I need bifurcation, which basically allows that single by 16 slot to be divided into four. Uh, by four links. Um, and so you could do this at other combinations. Also, if you have a by eight slot, you could do it as two by four and, and so forth. So, uh, so essentially you're taking one PCIe slot on the motherboard and splitting it into a bunch of different, um, as if there were multiple um, by four slots and you connected uh, one NVMe disk to each of those. So um, as I said, this enables multiple M.2 drives to, to connect via independent by four. And the, the host OS basically sees them as independent PCIe devices and not just one card. And this feature needs support both in the motherboard and in the BIOS. So you can see the BIOS screenshot here on the side where I picked uh, this slot four uh, and um, the the it's bifurcated now into four by fours. So it says as linked as a by four, uh, but there are four of them. Uh, so um, uh, there are adapters. So this this adapter, there are um, cards that uh, have this bifurcation logic built in. So it it. Uh, you don't need the motherboard support, but just those adapter cards are like 150, <laughs> 175. It's really expensive. Uh, whereas the the cheaper cards, which which require the motherboard to support the bifurcation, um, you can get them less than 100 bucks. Uh, depend if, like I I went with a, an Asus one, and this one was I think. Um, 75-ish when when I got it, and I've seen it on sale for even cheaper at times. Um, but the the more expensive ones have the bifurcation logic on the card. Um, but but uh, if you already have it in the motherboard, you can buy the cheaper adapter. And there's some other like no name brand ones which are even cheaper. You can get something for under 50 bucks. Uh, I, I don't know how well they work. The reviews were kind of mixed, uh, but uh, you can certainly try them. But since my motherboard already supported it, um, I didn't need the, the fancy card. Uh, and so, yep, that's how I, uh, that's how I plugged uh, that in and that slotted into that fourth uh, PCIe slot. You can see my graphics card is, uh, is over there, and I still have uh, other slots available. So, um, in the future, if I want to add another NIC or something else, I still have expansion room uh, available. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is while these cards are actually Gen 4 cards, so PCIe Gen 4 capable, uh, but this machine, the, the, the PCIe, uh, controller is only Gen 3 speed. Um, it's not such a big deal uh, for me. I'm not going to look at very, very high bandwidth uh, storage. Um, and, you know, for right now, I'm, I'm anyway going to be limited by my, by my network speed, unless I upgrade to um, 
uh, 10 gigabit or something. So I just have gigabit ethernet. Uh, so in terms of uh, what I what I did, so, um, uh, so TrueNAS scale is running um, in a VM um, inside, uh, inside Proxmox. And then um, I installed Nextcloud um, uh, in a container, right? So this is running on the, I said, uh, TrueNAS scale supports Kubernetes. And so they have a whole kind of mini app store and you can just, you can just pull the Nextcloud image um, directly. Uh, so, so Nextcloud is running as a container within the TrueNAS uh, VM. So, um, and like I said, the the this is syncing files across, uh, you know, our laptops and desktops that we have at home, and then pictures and videos taken on our phones um, also get uh, synced automatically. So between phones and whatever desktop laptop we have it's about eight clients at home obviously not all of them are on simultaneously uh, but uh, it's been working without any um, without any issues uh, so um, the other hard disk that i said that's uh, that contains media and other things that i didn't want to put on flash storage uh, so uh, those ones uh, are not on Nextcloud, so Nextcloud is all on on the on the on the flash pool. Um, all my other files, larger ones or less frequently needed ones, and that, ones that I don't want to synchronize across these devices, um, those are in a separate disk, and that disk gets mostly myself. I think my wife sometimes does it, but um, I mount that on my on my desktop and I access it that way. Um, I have a VM that's uh, running Home Assistant, which is a home automation and, and monitoring platform uh, that could itself be in a whole talk by itself. But um, I only recently started doing this. Uh, uh, we installed um, solar panels on our roof uh, a little while ago, and uh, this uh, is logging the production data directly from the a solar inverter. I also have a couple of, you know, these smart plugs that uh, uh, that allow me to uh, turn on or off uh, devices at home, and uh, uh, have one that also measures uh, power. It's not super accurate, but I get I get power measurements, and all of them uh, work through um, Home Assistant. I built uh, I, I built a, a water leak sensor um, uh, using using an ESP32 board, uh, and there are integrations for all of that within within Home Assistant. So if uh, if uh, uh, water if my sump pump uh, stops working and water starts getting into my basement, um, this thing will send me a notification. Uh, and then, you know, I run a bunch of, um, like I said, test VMs. I'm, if I have to try out some software or, or some new tool, I just um, create a VM, install it. And then if I don't need it anymore, I just toss it. So this is basically what's been running on that on this machine. So I set this machine, I think it was in uh, August or September uh, last year. So it's been four or five months. And uh, um, it's been it's been running well. Uh, uh, didn't get any complaints from my family. Uh, that's the main thing. Uh, so the uh, so large file transfers um, are limited by my by my network. Like I said, I have a single gigabit Ethernet NIC on this machine, and I'm I'm limited by that. So I didn't really do any extensive benchmarking, but when I just did a couple of, uh, you know, large movie files, uh, if I tried to copy over, um, I basically got 90, 95 uh, megabytes per second, which is which is uh, what I can expect from a gigabit Ethernet link. Uh, so if I really need higher bandwidth, so if I, I, I don't do much video editing, but when I do, I just do that on my local machine uh, and then, 
um, transfer the the edited image over to uh, the NAS. Uh, so I'm not doing live editing over the, the network. Uh, but if I want to do that uh, in the future, I would have to switch to a, a 10 gigabit um, Ethernet. So my uh, when we did some home remodeling a while ago and I gave a talk about um, my network setup uh, uh, again a couple of years ago, um, uh, uh, that time I had uh, uh, Cat6 uh, cabling uh, all through my house. So it does support uh, 10 gigabit uh, speeds. So I would just need to buy uh, uh, a switch and uh, Nix for my, for my desktop and this um and this server uh, if i needed to uh, if i needed to uh, run at faster bandwidth higher bandwidth um so i measured power on this machine using the the uh the smart plug that has power monitoring uh and uh over a few months I, i've looked at it it's it's about 65 watts on average so it's certainly <laughs> not low power um I didn't try to optimize it too much. Uh, I think if I if I fiddle with the power management settings, I might be able to shave off a little bit more. I just haven't had the the time to do that. Um, and when I look at the part, uh, tends to oscillate between 50 watts and 150 watts uh, for the most part. Um, and like I said, the average is 65. And so. Uh, uh, my latest power bill, I think um, it's about 33 cents a kilowatt hour. So um, this is costing me roughly 50 cents a day. Uh, I could probably get cloud storage and other things for, for cheaper than, you know, let's say, 15 bucks a month. Uh, but I like having all my data within, within my four walls. Um, uh, and what I do is... Uh, Every once in a while, I will uh, uh, plug a, a, an external, uh, uh, one of those USB to SATA adapters. I then take a backup of everything. And then I take that disk and stick it in my drawer uh, at work. So this gives me the, 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 I have two backups at home and then one outside, which is infrequent generally do it once or uh, once a month or once every other month but in case my uh you know house burns down or something i have i have um uh, you know uh, a month old backup that i can go retrieve from my office so that's my backup strategy uh yeah that's i think my slides i can I can uh, show you my instance. Uh, one second. Any questions before I go to the demo portion? Uh, okay. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So you have your three flash drives in. Um, RAID Z1, right? Yeah. Does that put any significant amount of strain on the CPU? Not as far as I can tell, no. Uh, uh, you can see the my load, right? Um, uh, this is, oh, uh, this is on the overall system, right? You can see the, the load average isn't much. Um, and this is specifically, uh, so the percent, so I have a, a dedicated four cores so basically four threads of my 12 threads to this and my utilization is about this much so it's not not a whole lot uh, again maybe if i'm if i use it more heavily it maybe uh, it may go up but my uh, as i said my my uses are use cases fairly modest so i don't i don't i see occasional spikes uh when there's replication and other things going on and that's where the power also spikes. Uh, it, because I looked at when those spikes were happening, it's always you know after midnight when I've set it up to do the 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 snapshotting and the and the replication. Uh, and 
uh, at that time, um, the power goes up and CPU usage, I haven't looked at it, but I'm assuming that went up during those those periods as well. But baseline, it's, it's always been about this, around this. Um, any other questions? All right, okay, so this is this is my machine um, uh, uh, running running Proxmox, and you can see it's uh, it thinks it has twelve uh, uh, CPUs. So that's a twelve thread, so six six physical cores and and two hyper threads per core. So so twelve cores overall, uh, uh, sixty four uh, gigabytes of of uh, of memory, and uh, the the boot disk is taking up about 100 gigabytes, um, and swap is almost never touched. Uh, <clears throat> and the yeah, you can see the the load, the memory usage. So basically, um, I allocated. So if you so these are my VMs here on the left. Um, so your true NAS, my Unify controller. This T box is my test box, and I keep trashing it. <laughs> if I uh, often, and then this is my home assistant um, instance. So these are the these are usually it's three VMs. You know, occasionally I'll I'll start the uh, a test VM for for various things. Sometimes I have multiple, um, and uh, so these are the the four VMs that are running. And then this is the um, on the local. Uh, this is where I have all my VM disks. The um, ISO um, images. So if I need a test VM, it's almost always uh, based on this this Debian um, version. Uh, and uh, what else? Uh, um, if here, if I go to disks, uh, so that's the terabyte uh, NVMe uh, that I'm using. And out of that 100 gigabytes roughly gets used for Proxmox host itself. And then I have a little bit more available. And then this is where this other pool is where I am um, stashing all my all my VM um, uh, images. Uh, it's, uh, I'm trying to remember where the where all the VM images show up, I think it's here. Yeah, so these are all my all my VM disks and whatever snapshots I have. So that's the space it's consuming. And then I'll occasionally back up uh, these ones, these images as well, just in case my VM crashes, I can go back to a go back to a backup. Um, uh, and then for network, it's just a it's just a one NIC, which is a, a one gig, and it set it up as a as a as a bridge. And then if you see uh, on the on the uh, VMs, uh, 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 I can where's my network. Uh, oh yeah, so I can I can set up VLAN tags um, as I want. So these VMs are all on 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 different different VLANs. So just looking at uh, my TrueNAS um, itself, uh, you can see I gave it uh, 40 gigabytes, and TrueNAS will basically claim all of it. Um, it'll cache um, as much as possible. So it, whatever RAM you can throw at it. It's going to utilize most of it as as disk cache, and as we were just talking, the the CPU usage isn't bad, and and you can see network traffic, so um, whatever is going on, um, synchronization on on Nextcloud or or um, at the moment I don't have my desktop uh, doing anything, so the the NFS mount there is probably not doing much traffic. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that's this, and when you want to configure it, like these are all the options. So I, I've passed through um, the uh, uh, 
these PCIe devices. So this is the, these are the three um, NVMe disks on that, uh, the, those drives in the adapter card. So these show up as, as three different devices. And instead of exposing them to Proxmox, I basically pass them straight through to the to the TrueNAS VM. So these will show up as a separate PCIe devices on the TrueNAS side. And then these three are what go into the um, into the RAID Z1 uh, pool. Uh, then I have this disk, which is just the uh, the the boot disk uh, boot drive for for uh, TrueNAS scale. And then I have another uh, disk that I that I uh, allocated out of the LVM pool uh, in Proxmox, and this is where I'm uh, this is where I'm storing all the other containers that are running inside of TrueNAS. So the um, uh, Nextcloud and stuff that runs uh, that is stored on on this uh, on this partition. Uh, and other than that, it's kind of standard uh, uh, configuration. Like I said, 40 gigs of RAM, four cores, uh, and just these are all mostly just default uh, default things. Um, and so, yeah, the, the the most important thing is the is the uh, pass through of these devices. Um, in the future, if I want to plug in another GPU and and do some um, GPU compute or anything then I can do the same method and um, pass through uh, that GPU to whatever VM I want. Uh, I mean, when I when I was uh, reading about this initially, people were having all kinds of problems online, getting the pass through to work reliably. I had zero problems. Um, I don't know if, if it's just because of the type of device I have or what, but I had no problems. I just had to go here configure the pass through and then when I booted into to NAS scale it just showed up as as PCIe devices and um, as as storage so uh, I had I had virtually uh, no trouble um, getting all of this um, set up and yeah there's there's not much more interesting I mean these other VMs I just gave one or two CPUs a little bit of RAM and they're, they're chugging along. Um, uh, uh, no problem. So, I mean, this is the, this is the Proxmox, and and you know, I can I can go here and I can get a get a, a shell uh, on the. This is the root uh, Proxmox shell, and you know, I can do whatever commands I want. I can do from here uh, SCP, whatever I need. I can just do it from the shell here. I don't even have to separately SSH in, although I can do that as well. Um, um, uh, and similarly, you can get you can get a console on on any any VM. So I just go over here, hit console. Um, same thing I get I get this um, uh, console shell uh, for for that for that VM. So it's it's pretty nice how everything is is uh, uh, laid out here, and you know if I need to create a new VM or new container, um, those things over here. So I can just say create create VM, uh, which node VM ID, uh, give it a name, and then I can go over pick uh, pick uh, what ISO image. So if I need a Debian machine, I just go click there. So once you've uploaded the uh, the the ISOs that you would want to use for any of your VMs, uh, you can just drop it down here, and and then you can kind of just walk through the these things. So uh, allocate how much storage you want, uh, how many CPUs, and what what particular CPU flags you want to expose uh, to the to the guest. So if there are certain things you don't want it to do. Um, you can just the, the but I think by default some of these are enabled. But if you explicitly want to enable or disable, um, you can go you can go do that. Um, tell it how much memory you want, what network configuration um, you want. Um, uh, you know I can do VLAN tags. Um, 
all of this. And then finally, I just hit confirm and you know, in a few seconds, uh, VM is, is created. So then I can go into the console for that VM. And if there's installation options or whatever, I can, I can boot, boot into that, um, that guest. So it's, it's, I've had no trouble. I mean, I just had to look up a couple of things for like the PCIe pass through and few other couple of other settings is what I had to refer to some documentation. But other than that, it's kind of I like this interface. Um, pretty pretty easy to uh, to do what I want. So um, that's Proxmox. Um, and uh, oops. Um, so this is TrueNAS, and it times out every few minutes. Um, so if you go into the dashboard, uh, you get this picture, and this is what I was talking about. Um, it it uh, pretty much uses all the memory. It claims everything that's given, and you can see it's using 18 gigabytes for caching a lot of the stuff. Um, all the other services that are running on top is consuming about eight and a half gigabytes, and then uh, 12 are free uh, for for um, new things that come up. Uh, but this gives you a good dashboard, shows you how much um, CPU you're using. And uh, one of the things I did in when my Proxmox config was basically expose what the underlying CPU is so that if there's any CPU specific optimizations that the, the guest OS can do, it knows what it is. So you could also virtualize this and say it's some generic x86 CPU uh v2 something but um uh but unless you have some security concerns you can expose this to the uh to the vm and which is what i did uh and you can see the usage is pretty pretty low most of the time uh and here's the network activity and you can see some amount of uh, incoming and outgoing outgoing traffic uh my system has been up for uh, one and a half months. Uh, and then in the storage, uh, you can see, so I, these are the different pools that I set up. So a, a pool is basically a um, combination of one or more disks. Uh, uh, and so the, this is the app pool. This is what I passed through from, um, from Proxmox for the application storage so which is all the the containers that I wanted to run um, that's in that's in this 128 gigs that I uh, passed from the LVM pool on the on proxmox and I'm only using a little bit of that uh, then uh, my three um, SSDs there were two terabytes each uh, I put that into a pool creatively called flash pool uh, and so that's in a RAID Z1 configuration. So, um, so out of the roughly six terabytes storage, only only two thirds is is uh, available uh, usable capacity, and I've seemed to use about a half terabyte of that so far. Uh, and, and then you can do all the all the smart checks and. And, and all of that. And if there's any failures, you'll see that here. Thankfully, I haven't had any problems. Um, and then the third pool, again, very creatively called Rust pool, which is my, which is my hard disk. So um, I had two disks under this. Uh, I had to take one out, but uh, there were there were essentially two different pools anyway, so it didn't matter. Uh, and this is my six terabyte uh, disk that I'm using to back up uh, things from uh, from Nextcloud. That's mostly what's using the flash pool. And then I have some other stuff there. So that's what it's using up, um, using up this space. Um, and you can see those details here um, under the data sets, under each thing, uh, under each uh, pool, you create a data set. Uh, and for my, uh, uh, flash pool, I have the Nextcloud uh, data and there's a database separately. So these are all the files and the database contains the 
all the metadata and everything related to that. Um, so those are two separate pools. And then I have this uh, home, which is, um, I mount this as my home directory on, on certain machines. So all that comes out of this flash pool allocation. And then the Rust pool is the backup for, uh, for this. And then my old system used to be called Pogo. I just transferred all that data. And, and, and this one is the one that's shared over, over NFS. Uh, so this is all my data. And if you look at the shares, I just have uh, that one being exposed via NFS. If I wanted to uh, share the same thing over SMB, I could do that as well. Um, and then under data protection, it's all the periodic um, snapshots, replication, all that can be set up here. Again, you can just click add. It was very easy to figure out um, all of this. I didn't configure any rsync tasks directly. Uh, I have a script that I had from before and um, I, I just run that. I, I could run that via cron if I choose to, but um, I haven't bothered to set up all that yet. So uh, periodically uh, uh, I will uh, back up everything, like I said, to the external disk and, and store that outside my house. So all that I can do th those kind of things simply by um, um, R-syncing uh, some of these other uh, uh, data sets uh, over to the over to that external disk. So it's 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 it, it, I was actually very surprised how easy it was to set up. I very very rarely had to uh, go drop down to the shell and fiddle with something there. Um, most of the things I needed I could just accomplish from uh, from from this web interface. Very simple to do. Um, same thing with network config, not not much here. Uh, and then here, virtualization. Right? So this is where if I were to run um, TrueNAS scale as my host OS, I could go and add VMs. I tried this and it, it was not as easy as Proxmox, which is why I am choosing to run this as a VM, uh, as I explained before. And then apps, here is where um, Nextcloud is running um, within uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I also running this thing called Collabora, which is allows me to um, uh, uh, edit. Like it's it's sort of a uh, Google Docs style thing, so I can have documents on my TrueNAS um, uh, share with, uh, on my Nextcloud, which I can then edit right here within the browser. Um, it's a little finicky. Uh, it it loses its mind sometimes, and I have to restart the service. Uh, but when it works, it works pretty well. So I can quickly open um, documents and other stuff without having to start um, LibreOffice on my on my machine. So I can do this from any machine anywhere. Uh, uh, you know. Um, I have I have a VPN set up uh, on my on my router so that <clears throat> if I'm if I'm outside the house then I can I can simply uh, it's a WireGuard uh, VPN so I can run I can connect to my network via WireGuard and then I can get to my TrueNAS so my TrueNAS is, isn't directly exposed um, outside my network. Uh, and so if you go over here to discover apps, uh, there is there is a whole host of applications uh, that you can run. So you, you can choose to run WireGuard directly on TrueNAS. And, you know, um, I, I went through all of this. There's just so many, so many things um, here. Uh, uh, so all the torrent services, whatever you want to do, it's it's all it's all here. I could have run my Unify controller also um, uh, um, as a as a container. Uh, I already had a VM for that, so I just continue to run it as a VM. But that's another thing you could do uh, here. Um, uh, you can run PyHole, um, bunch of things um, um, here. Um, 
Collabora, which I just talked about, I installed that. Home assistance is another thing we can run on top of this. Uh, again, I already had the VM, so I chose to run it as, as a VM. And you can see uh, Nextcloud. Uh, uh, there's, there's a bunch of things you can, I, I have to find the expanded version here, but, but you can, you could run like a GitLab instance, a uh, bunch of different things are all available as containers. You can just um, literally, uh, you know, it's click install done. Very, very easy. Uh, so those are all the apps. And then this reporting screen shows me the CPU uses. You can see it spikes every once in a while, but otherwise the CPU usage is, is uh, pretty pretty low. Uh, because this is a VM, I think the CPU temperature um, interface doesn't get through. Um, so I'll have to look at it on, my, on the host side. Um, yeah, load average, uh, not much. Uh, this is just CPU. I can see similar stats for for memory, um, and it shows me how much historically, how much how much it has used for caching versus um, other things, and no swap usage. Uh, and same thing for for network. You can see how much network traffic there has been, uh, and I can zoom zoom out. So this is over the past hour while I've been talking here and I can zoom out and show you more. So you can see not much network traffic has um, happened um, in general. Uh, and um, this one shows the disk activity. Uh, so again, pretty, pretty low usage. Okay, so that was TrueNAS, uh, and then this is my kind of home assistant. Uh, you can see how much solar power generated uh, on that day. I can go overview uh, so I can get power information and, and so forth. Uh, and this is um, uh, this is my next cloud. I just I just logged into a test account just to show you kind of how it works, and. You can go here. Um, um, these are all your all your files, and um, you can um, in your desktop or or phone app, you can decide which which folders get synchronized uh, to what device. Um, and so, if I run the desktop client on 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 my laptop, for instance. Then I can I can pick which of which of these uh, files and folders I want synchronized locally to my um, to my machine. So it's uh, and then I can log in via the this interface and and look at it through. So if I wanted to open this, yeah, something is messed up. Like I said, that that Collabora thing is is somewhat finicky. I'll have to restart it. But but if there is like in this case a a, a document, I can just um, you know, you should be, uh, if this worked, you can just go here and say new spreadsheet, uh, give it a name, create um, blank. Uh, and I can just open it here. And if this worked, <laughs> uh, I could have just opened the spreadsheet here and, and, and edited it uh, similar to um, like a Google Doc or Google Sheets. So uh, I've been pretty, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, your your um, own cloud or next cloud. Are, are you able to run that with um, NFS mounts to the actual files, or does everything have to be local on that server? Uh, it has to be local. I I think. I mean, you can you can navigate the file system and find where the files are, but the permissions yep. and everything makes it difficult <laughs> to then um, mount it as NFS. So, okay, so the workaround cool. I have, the workaround I have, is that uh, in my replication, I replicate everything in Nextcloud onto my other disk, and then I can I can mount that disk. Ah, uh, okay, that's cool. That makes sense. <laughs> so, uh, but it's one way only. Like if I change it, then I'll have I can't sync it back, right? But if it's if it's just for read access, uh, that works. 
right? Because I'm, I'm, it's a one-way uh, replication from Nextcloud to my other disk, and then I can mount that disk. But if, then if I change anything on that disk, that's it's effectively like a backup, and so it doesn't touch this um, this live data. So in a pinch, if I just need to go uh, access something, I'm not changing anything, I can get to it. Uh, but if I really want to modify it, I have to copy it, uh, change it, and then remember to go drop it into um, into Nextcloud next time I'm connected to it. But that's, that's a, a mess, but I, it, it makes sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a it's, yeah. <laughs> it, they didn't make it. I mean, I, I wish there was a way just here on the interface to say go expose this as a NFS mount, and um, I couldn't find anything to uh, to accomplish that. Uh -huh. I believe you. I, I believe you can do something similar to that, not through NFS, but through something called Web DAV, which is very similar to NFS, but it's a lot slower. And the reason they do that is because Nextcloud maintains a database of all your files and their locations. And if you were to directly update your files or add a new one, it wouldn't be added to the database. So you kind of have to do it through this. Mm -hmm. web dav kind of awkward thing but it does oh. achieve what is very similar to nfs it's just ah. kind of a lot slower okay oh i never Wait. interesting interesting yeah, you can, i never you looked can mount at it, it. Just, and that's... then just access your files from the cli just like you would nfs ah okay but like i, I said it's a lot that. slower than nfs okay okay yeah i mean you wouldn't use that normally but if in a pinch you need to do something uh that might work. Okay, that, that's a, that's good. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I need to be dropping off in about five minutes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shankar. It was very interesting. Oh, you're welcome. I can hang around for another five minutes. Mm -hmm. I have one quick, quick last question. And, and by the way, thank you. This has been awesome. And this is a lot of what I've implemented at my office and one, two at home. So this was a great um, overview. Uh, really quickly, how do you back up your Proxmox VMs? Do you do it via that the built-in utility there or do you do it a different way? I, I, I just go uh, SCP those files, the, the, the disks directly, the images. So I, ah. I drop in, I drop into the console, and I have all the disks. Um, I forget where it is now, but but I can I can uh, I have a script that just just SCPs everything over to to another disk. Excellent. Does it SCP like a snapshot or the live running snapshot? The snapshot. Yes. Yeah. So I take Perfect. a cool. So Thank I you. take a snapshot and then I I back up the snapshot. Perfect. Thanks.